Welcome to The Life, an e-news media presentation. I'm Andy Cohen. And I'm Paul Romano. We hope you enjoy this glimpse into the life of Brooklyn Friends School. The Perfect Summertime Yesterday by Otto Moran. Suppose that's what it was, a wasted summer's day, half full in its taunting, so loving in its play, that struck me in my work so weary, took me by and tucked me dear, a willow in the rough, massed and yet so clear. My aspirations hung at noon, a vivid red or blue, buried like a blossom, waiting for a cue to pierce the evening like a sharp sea after a sea, and bring to me the dissonance which helps take me to sleep. I waited there, a wild willow in the field, living through my hopes like dandelion yield, puffing from the smoke way up in the high, tickled pink as if my fate would pass me by. The goings of the come and go went a while more, till twilight busted down the roof. I entered through the door to watch my vivid reds or blues as I had once lived before. Hi, this is Andy Cohen. And this is Paul Romano. And here we are at the last episode of our third season of The Life. And now for our final episode, we want to go really old school. Our first five episodes in our first season, we're just audio podcasts. So today, we're going to do just an audio podcast. Tell us a little bit about it, Paul. We've been wanting to work with the English department for a long time. And now that Word Flirt is coming out, the Upper School Literary Magazine, we thought that we would uh, feature student works, poems, and short stories. And we wanted the texts to speak for themselves. But we thought we'd do it with a little audio. So we've, we've kind of produced these with faculty and ourselves doing the read and to give them a, a different point of view or a different perspective and hopefully a, maybe a larger audience. Now we're going to pass you along to Rahel Mazor, Upper School English Department Chair, who's going to tell you all about this episode. Word Flirt is the Upper School Literary and Arts magazine featuring student writing and art that students have uh, created either in class or on their own. This year, a lot of our submissions were poems. Uh, we also got a couple of short stories and kind of personal essays. We got one very unusual poem that was actually written as a piece of code that when you run it, it turns into a poem. Today we are reading aloud some of the selections from Word Flirt. A few of them were honored with Scholastic Writing Awards recognition. Others are pieces that we just thought would be terrific to share. Some of them fit the theme of summertime in particular. We try to integrate creative writing projects into our curriculum at every grade level, but additionally students are encouraged to do their own creative writing through a variety of ways. We have creative writing SLAs, which are student-led activities. Students are urged to submit pieces to the Scholastic Writing Awards and for publication, and some of our students participate in the New England Young Writers Conference every year. The two students who went this year are both featured in Word Flirt as well. Left foot, right foot, Jack Donnellan. It's sunny, blazing hot, absolutely unbearable. Nobody leaves their houses when it gets this hot. It's Utah. So everyone is always adequately prepared during the summer for the extreme heat. Not everybody has air conditioning out here, but everyone has large containers of drinkable water stacked up in their kitchens and fans Everyone has those little fans that you can buy at ShopRite on sale for $2. Hand fans, ceiling fans, red fans, blue fans, purple fans. I take one look back at our old wooden house, covered in bright red dirt from the surrounding desert. I'm on my way to New York for the first time. I've been dreaming of the city's excitement with its bright lights and tall buildings since I was a little kid. I've been to other cities before here out west, Denver, Las Vegas, Salt Lake City, even Phoenix, all of which have tall buildings and are exciting enough, but none of these past trips feels like this one. New York energy is plain different from Vegas energy. 
Vegas crushes people's dreams. New York is where people go to find their dreams before getting them crushed. Vegas streets are worn, dirty, and tired. New York streets are worn, tired, and just plain different. My suitcase is packed in our family van, and I won't see it again until I pick up my four-door Toyota Corolla rental car at JFK Airport. I've already been instructed by my mother on the dangers of New York, a place she was able to escape from with my father so many years ago. Her brother still lives in the city, and her father and sister's families have houses upstate New York. That's why I need the car to visit Aunt Rhonda. I crawl into the passenger seat and glance over at my mother, who is apprehensively wiping off the sweat from her forehead. She hates that I'm doing this, absolutely hates it. I can tell from the disapproving stare she's been flashing at me lately whenever I talk about New York City. If it weren't for my mild-mannered, set-in-his-ways father, I don't think that she'd ever even let me talk about the place. We know it's only bad memories for her, but we never talk about that. As we drive, I try to relax and not listen to my mother's rant about driving in the city and getting hit by crazy taxi drivers. That's when the feeling starts. It's a sink-in-your-stomach, awful, sickly feeling. I'm nervous. Perhaps it's everything my mother said that is now starting to make me second-guess my decision. But it's also something more. Apprehension. I've never gone to a city bigger than Denver. I can see my future embarrassment in the images flashing through my head. I gently close my eyes and try to think about nothing. I wake up startled to find my mother banging on the car window. I glance at my watch. It's already 3.15, less than an hour from now, and I'll be in the air. I hear honking cars and loud noises. As I step into Terminal 3 of the Las Vegas airport, I glance back at my mother. It's as if her tough love has made me uniquely prepared for this moment. She's back in the van, honking loudly and desperately trying to pull out of the blocked airport departures bay. I take a moment to consider her gruff personality, perfectly juxtaposed with the laid-back feeling of the Las Vegas Mandalay Bay Casino Hotel visible in the distance behind her. Delta Airlines Flight 545 is uneventful, for the most part. We land safely, so that's all that matters. For a few moments, I try and fail to peer over my seatmates to look out the window. And so I spend the moments until we park at the gate, staring at the seatbelt sign above my head. Part of me wants to stay on the Boeing 737 and keep on eating pretzels out of the little bag. Getting up from the seat will be one of the hardest, scariest moments in my life. Stepping outside for the first time since getting on the plane, I take a breath of fresh air. I listen to the click of the automatic doors behind me, accompanied by a host of other sounds. The combination of babies crying, cars honking, and people shouting beckons me further. This is my place. I start walking towards the car rental, watching my feet closely. My boots, still covered in the bright red desert dirt from my hometown, are visibly different to those of my fellow travelers. New York had become part of me at first sight, but my home will always be my home. I know that my mother felt different about this place, but the moment doesn't get to be about her. I walk not feeling proud, but feeling satisfied. I am unique. I watch as one foot comes after another. Left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot. Untitled by Chelsea Parker. Laying on the warm green grass, thinking, just thinking, reading my book under the sun, plugged into my headphones with the music that goes. A thump distracts and I look up. There's one, two, three, five kids staring, smiling. Two of them have a football. Three of them run around me, and they stare at me. I say hello, and they smile and run. Young children, about the age of four and five, loving and carefree, screaming and playing on the grass, 
a moving image of adolescence, wishing nothing more than for the sun to keep shining as bright as their love and youth, sitting on the warm green grass, I stare and smile and a tear falls. Books and Daughters by Claire Borden. I see beauty in my daughter every day. I see her in the mornings with those drooping eyelids, frizzy hair, and pajama pants slightly turned to the right. I greet her with a simple phrase, and she returns the act, but usually with a moan and a grunt. I love her smile and the way she sings the song of laughter when hearing a joke. Her swirled hair glistens red in the sun, but dark brown under the light of the dining room. When I walk far ahead, her cheeks fly to her eyes, and her arms swing to the sun as she skips towards me. Her lips are full and plump, but she often hides them with her teeth and hands. Her face scrunches like an elastic band when she is frustrated, and my inability to stop smiling and chuckling only annoys her more. I saw something in her I had never witnessed before. The dark and malicious, Scylla-like creature that inhabited her soul and mind crept out of its hiding. Its shadow filled her face, eyes, and hands as she strained every muscle in her body. Her pupils shrank to a dot, her arms flung around her body carelessly, and her hair seemed to flatten like a balloon. I've always been fond of reading and appreciated literature, but my daughter hasn't. She used to pout and complain when I forced her to read, but I wanted to teach her the gifts from reading, which led me over the summer to give her a book I thought she would love. She asked why it was long and why I thought she'd want to read 500 pages. I explained that books, no matter the length, are worth reading. More paper and ink does not mean the author's story is any less important. She mumbled something, took the book, and said she would read it when she had the chance. But over the weeks, I became impatient and nudged her to read it. She procrastinated and comforted me with her words by telling me she had not finished the books on her personal summer reading list. The warm weather was whisked away and the school year began, but the book remained on the desk. I checked the book's location whenever I was in her room gathering laundry or borrowing a pen and noticed it had been inching around the furniture in random directions. I sensed my daughter's lack of desire for the book and believed she would never open it to the first page. But I chose not to discuss the presence of the unwanted book with her as the beauty in these small movements and efforts to place it in the original position fascinated me. My daughter told me she had begun reading the book I have longed for her to begin a few days ago. It did not continue to stay on the desk, but attached to her hands, eyes, and mind. She flipped through the first 100 pages in a week, but did not forget to complain about the 400 pages that remained. When working in the basement, I heard something from the room directly above me. The noises were not thumps or thuds, but mumbles and long, staggered tones. Maybe my daughter was talking to herself. No matter what I thought the noises were, I concluded she was safe. But as the sounds became louder, yet still unclear, I heard a sudden change from a low to a high tone. There was a long period of silence before an unexpected scream startled me, and I began to briskly move up the stairs, telling myself she was not hurt. The shouting continued as I followed the sounds and walked to my daughter's bedroom. I opened the door and saw her hands quickly push the book close to her face. It pressed into the tip of her nose, and the book began to shake in her hands. Her dark, wet eyes stared at it. Her trembling face cried as she yelled and tightened her clasp on the book. She stood from her chair as the book was released from her dripping face, and the book was thrown against the wall with a strength I had never seen before. The 500 pages smashed onto the concrete and slid to the floor. I watched the pages curl underneath each other and fold in half. My daughter stopped yelling and heavily gasped for air. She turned towards me and showed me her gray eyes, clamped fists, and structured face. This was not my beautiful daughter. I stepped away from the doorframe and walked away so as not to face the monster. I heard no movement from her room for the remainder of the night. She stood staring at the tortured book as her beautiful colors dimmed into a black and white figure. All the energy and life in her spirit were pushed out. The book and my daughter's soul were lifeless and forgotten and nothing more. The book is not harmful. It contains no slurs, discrimination, or violence. It is a book about a beautiful girl and her life. The character lives happily and enjoys reliving her story again whenever someone is ready to listen. 
But when my daughter tortured the book, the girl was crushed between the curling pages and forced to stop telling her story. It has not moved from the floor, and the girl patiently waits and hopes my daughter will soon pick it up, straighten the pages, and finish reading the book. But for now, the girl waits on the floor, stuck in time between her beginning and her first obstacle. I noticed when getting my daughter's laundry that the book had moved back to the desk, but was now in a corner. I flipped to the marked page, which had not changed since the last time I picked it up. As I gently pressed my fingers against the creases, questions and thoughts crowded my head. Could I have saved her from the creature? I should have stopped the wicked thing before it took over her soul, that beautiful, radiant soul. I didn't protect her, the one person I was meant to care for. How can I bring her back? My mind only wanted silence, but it could not forbid the nasty thoughts from forming. I wanted my daughter to return. I wanted the book gone, so I picked it up and walked downstairs to the fireplace. But I stopped on the last step. Admiring the delicately written name of the owner on the cover, my body turned in the opposite direction of the fireplace and guided me to the desk. I opened the bottom drawer and hid the book under envelopes and bills. I left it in the wooden drawer to rest forever, hoping it would stay there as I waited for a resurrection to ensue. My Mess by Sean Wong. Dear reader, it is likely that you are looking at my poem and have no idea how to read it, so I have come to help. The first part is the original poem, written in the most simple commands of the programming language C. The second part is what the computer would print if the program were to run, and it is what I envision the poem to be. Please try to read the first part first, and then read the second part if you need help understanding. To read the first part of the poem, read string title equals my comma 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 mess, which states that the title of the poem is my comma 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 mess. Then read everything after me comma 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 backslash n in backslash n visible, treating each backslash n as moving the poem down to the next line. Hashtag include less than STDIO period H greater than STR title equals quote my comma 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 mess quote semicolon int main main parentheses bracket print F parentheses quote percent S backslash n, backslash n, backslash n, me, comma, 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 backslash n, in, backslash n, visible, backslash n, silent, backslash n, backslash n, backslash n, ones, backslash n, and backslash n, zeros, backslash n, destroy each other, backslash n, backslash n, backslash n, me, comma, 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 backslash n, lying, backslash n, trapped, backslash n, between, backslash n, backslash n, backslash n, ones, backslash n, cry out, backslash n, zeros, backslash n, shout, about, backslash n, backslash n, backslash n, constant, backslash n, warfare, backslash n, never ending, backslash n, battlefield, backslash n, backslash n, backslash n, thought, backslash n, we could, backslash n, come, backslash n, together, backslash n, backslash n, backslash n, I, comma, 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 backslash n, was, backslash n, clearly, backslash n, wrong, backslash n, backslash n, backslash n, attendance, exclamation point, backslash n, listening, question mark, backslash n, gone, backslash n, understanding, backslash n, not present today, backslash n, peace, question mark, backslash n, absent as always, backslash n, community, question mark, backslash n, late, semicolon, will come forth, period, if lucky, backslash n, healing, question mark, backslash n, out sick, for the next few days, backslash n, love, question mark, backslash n, syntax, underscore, error, backslash n, string, colon, quote, love, quote, 
is defined backslash n humanity question mark backslash n please comma tell me that humanity came to school today i really want to see them period quote comma title semicolon return zero semicolon bracket my mess me in Visible, silent, capital N, ones, capital E, end, zeros, capital E, destroy, capital D, each, capital H, other, capital E, me, lying, capital L, trapped, capital P's, between, ones, cry out, zeros, shout about, Constant warfare, never ending battlefield, capital L, capital E. Thought we could come together. I was, capital A, capital S, clearly, capital E, wrong. Attendance, listening, gone, understanding. Not present today, peace. Absent as always, community. Late will come forth, period, if lucky. Healing. Out sick for the next few months. Love. Syntax error. String. Love is undefined. Humanity. Please tell me that humanity came to school today. I really want to see them. I'm Rachel Mazor, Chair of the Upper School English Department and a big fan of the writers in WordFlirt. If you want to read more, keep your eyes out for WordFlirt, the Upper School Literary Magazine, and also look for Scribe, the Middle School Magazine. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, students, for your wonderful work. And that just about wraps it up for this year and this season. And uh, here at The Life, we are wishing you all a happy and healthy summer break and we'll see you in September and just remember to let your writing speak. <laughs>